I'm Ian Thomas, editor of Front Office Sports. I'm here with Carrie Cohen, general counsel of New York Red Bulls. Carrie, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. So you're, you're going to be new to MLS, new to the Red Bulls. You've been in sports for a while, though. As, as you made this shift into soccer, what did you see in regards to the sport, in, in regards to MLS, in regards to the Red Bulls that really got you excited about this opportunity? Sure. I, mean, I don't even know where to begin. There are honestly so many things. But MLS, I would start out by saying that they're really expanding. And not only are they expanding, they're strategically expanding. By 2022, they're going to have 30 teams. They're really going to be competing with the other major leagues. Um, and soccer really excites me because it's universally I would even call it, you know, a language that everyone can speak. You take somebody from New York, you take somebody from France, you put a soccer ball between them, they know what it's all about. And I think that joining the MLS and the Red Bulls, it's going to be exciting to see all of these fans coming together, again, from different cultures, races, ethnicities, genders, and they all have something in common, and that's their love for the sport. So when you have the women's national team winning last year's World Cup, you have the build-up to the 2026 World Cup that will be hosted here in North America. I mean, when you think about the growth opportunity for North America, New Jersey even specifically, what sort of things are you seeing or what is your hope for what, how this could kind of transform the sport in a certain way? Sure, so I think that for young talent, having the World Cup here on our home turf is it's really inspiring. Um, there's a lot of, um, the Red Bulls have a terrific youth development program, um, and they've seen a lot of success with some of those individuals that they've grown from a very young age. For example, um, Tyler Adams, he, I believe, joined the youth program when he was 11 years old, and by the time he was 17, he was playing for the Red Bulls, and now he is in Europe. Um, and now for the Red Bulls to see that trajectory and to have him potentially competing in the World Cup, um, I think that's exciting and very inspiring for local talent. Well, I'm sure you saw a lot of that in Brooklyn, too, um, you know, and, and bringing all of those different folks from different backgrounds into a sport uh, and being part, part of bring, building an organization with that sort of thing in mind. That's exactly right, and it's something that I really enjoy doing in Brooklyn. I joined when we were just the New Jersey Nets, and I joined when Barclay Center was on the horizon, but a large focus of our leadership at the time was not only maintaining our New Jersey fan base and showing them the love and encouraging them to come with us to Brooklyn, but also developing a new fan base in Brooklyn and a new name for the Brooklyn Nets. Um, and what we always tried to be was to be synonymous with our surroundings and the people there. And we always tried to show some real grit and diversity. Um, culture was always very a large part of the organization. And I'm finding some significant similarities at the Red Bulls as well. Red Bulls are in a very similar, similar area, Harrison, New Jersey. It's up and coming. They're in a soccer specific stadium. So you have your soccer fans coming. They're excited for soccer. It's not that they just tried to fit the stadium within a football field or the like. Um, the Red Bulls are a globally recognized brand. The support that they receive from the parent company is just invaluable. Um, and I think that the culture and the growth of the organization under the GM Mark is something that I want to be a part of. I'm excited to become a part of it. So the, the general counsel role, I think, for a sports team is, is somewhat of a unique one. Obviously, the legal matters kind of play into everything that goes on behind the scenes and even, I guess, resulting in contracts that players have on the field. I mean, give me a little bit of sense of how you view the day-to-day -day of this job, if there even is kind of an atypical day-to-day -day on this front. Yeah, so it's funny, you caught yourself there because there is no typical day. Uh, right now with um, BSC Global, I'm the Deputy General Counsel. So it's, it's a similar role, except it would be, of course, more of a leadership position with the Red Bulls. Um, and no day is like a former one. Um, we have, we call all of, the, all of our colleagues clients. So they're all of our internal clients. Um, and we're representing each one of them with a different matter. So we represent our sponsorship team, our communications team, um, our ticketing team, our suites team, marketing. So we have to be very well versed in all aspects of the business. Um, I think we all, it's also very important for a general counsel to understand from the outset um, rather than just be a scribe of a deal and drafting it, they need to be part of the strategic vision. Um, they really need to be a business partner and help their internal clients achieve success or whatever their goals may be. And look, any negotiation, there's there's not a winner and a loser, which is also why I really like the transaction 
transactional aspect of the job. Um, of course, in any negotiation, you're gonna lose a couple of points and you're gonna win a couple of points. But at the end of the day, it's a marriage um, and you're gonna hopefully be in the relationship for quite some time um, rather than a litigation where there's a clear winner and a loser. So I think that's a really exciting aspect of the job. Um, I would say, as a general counsel, you're not a specialist. That's why you're a generalist. You sort of have to be a jack of all trades. Um, and that's a very, that's really um, attractive to me because I can learn a lot of different areas of the law. Um, and when I know something I don't know, I at least know that I don't know it and who to go to to ask the questions. So sports betting is obviously a huge topic in sports more broadly. Obviously, there's a number of legal considerations, but you're you know, going to be with a team now that's in New Jersey where sports betting is, is obviously legal. I mean, as you look at this role, as you look at even that landscape, what's your thoughts on kind of what we might see ahead for sports betting in 2020 and even specifically in New Jersey as it continues to grow and really do well even comparative to, to Nevada in a lot of ways? Yeah, so, so New Jersey really led the charge on um, sports betting, which is admirable and something that also drew me to the Red Bulls organization. I think that there's a lot of opportunity with sports betting. Um, New York, unfortunately, is not quite there yet, but I think they'll see soon enough that they're losing, frankly, a lot of revenue to New Jersey because it's much easier for New York residents to just go across the bridge or go through the channel, tunnel rather than go upstate to one of the four licensed casinos in order to place a sports bet. Um, I think that the leagues have done a really nice job of allowing teams to move forward with sports betting partnerships. Um, and I think that for just um, a run-of-the-mill fan who may be excited about sports but is not quite an avid fan, sports betting is going to help put more butts in the seats, frankly, more eyes on the TV, because fans now have really something invested mm -hmm. in the particular game, in the particular play. So it's it's definitely an exciting time in 2020 for sports betting. I mean, the same thing sort of happening in a lot of ways on the on the media side. A lot of fragmentation, a lot of OTT platforms, a lot of different places where you're seeing content being shared. Obviously, a lot of legal re concerns with you know when when these big right contracts come kind of around. I mean, what's your what are your thoughts in terms of what we're seeing in that marketplace? Obviously, how different leagues and properties are protecting themselves uh, from piracy or oversharing or things like that. Sure. So a couple of things. There are definitely risks um, that come along with the consumption of content, uh, but there are also a lot of opportunities. So I would say that now individuals, you know, especially in the MLS where the fans are so young, I think most of the fan base is 18 to 30 years, um, they want to consume content and they want to consume it wherever and whenever they want. I mean, just by way of example, one of my interns at the Nets was telling me he was at a wedding this past weekend, um, and he was watching the NFC Championship game while he was on the dance floor. I can't imagine that the bride and groom were very happy about it, but that's what he wanted to do, and he was able to do it. Um, and I think with all of these new types of technology that are coming out that can capture the game, it's going to be great opportunities for both leagues and teams to partner um, and to carve out certain categories so that they can make sure that they're maximizing revenue as much as possible. Um, but of course, coming along with that, you know, especially in the digital landscape, you have certain privacy concerns. So when you have consumers and end users coming to the teams and the league's websites, or really any website where the site is collecting information about its users, there are now um, a lot of different privacy laws that are on the horizon. I mean, following GDPR in the European Union, and most recently in California, the CCPA that was enacted, um, teams and leagues just need to be careful from a compliance standpoint.